give or take, it was time for him to be dedicated at the church we went to. Now understand, I grew up, the family I grew up in, the house I grew up in, we went to a church where they baptized babies. So when I was around six weeks old, I was baptized in the Methodist church in southern Wisconsin, in Kenosha. Okay? Even though we lived in Chicago, my parents went to the church up there because like the pastor up there. But anyway, so when Nathan was born, my mom gave me my baptismal outfit. It was a cute little thing with a little, you know, uh, it, it, it had uh, overalls that were shorts and they were plaid and a little, t a little shirt that buttoned all the way up to the neck. And, and she insisted that when he got baptized, we're like, Mom, we don't baptize babies, we dedicate babies. Okay, when he gets dedicated, he's got to wear this because you wore this when you got baptized. Now, my mother, at this point, did not understand that while I was a large baby, Nathan was a monster-sized baby. <laughs> and so somehow, Laura got him crammed into this thing. And it is just, you know, he's like, he's confused, but he's cute. And we take a picture of him, and then we're getting ready to leave, and the inevitable happens. That when you put a baby in clothes that are too tight, something has got to give. And he goes, Bleh. <laughs> all over it. And, you know, we're going to be late to church, everything. And, you know, we got him all dressed up for it. And then we ended up having to switch his outfit. I still don't remember whether or not we told mom about this yet, but that's okay. <laughs> but I think, you know, we felt really kind of constrained. Like, we've got to dress him up in this because this is what mom wants him to wear. And she's Grandma is the first grandchild and all that stuff. And I think sometimes when we come to God, we do the same thing. We think that we've got to pretty up what we're going to say. We think we've got to pretty up the way we look. We think we've got to fix up the way we're thinking and the way we're feeling and get in into this place where we're going to be acceptable to God before we can come and talk to Him. Before we can come and be with Him. You know, and the thing is that one of the places where this really shows up is in our prayers. That so often we feel like we have got to pre-screen what we ask God for. We've got to pre-screen and pull back and make sure that we only ask God for things that we think He would want us to have. Make sure that they're only respectable things. Make sure that they're only good things. And, and that that kind of a filter comes between us and our relationship with God. And, and one of the reasons we do this is we've all undergone that reality of prayer that does not get answered. That time in high school or in college where God did not provide that sudden burst of knowledge as the test was coming, even though you prayed about it that morning over and over again and through all of school before you hit when the test was coming. And yet somehow the knowledge of, of civics did not appear in your brain and allow you to ace the test. That maybe... It's being in that situation where you've got a, a nagging health problem that has gone on and on, and you have prayed, and you have prayed, and you have prayed, and yet it still seems to keep on coming back. Maybe it's being in that situation of being single, whether single because you lost your spouse, single because of your age, single because of whatever reason, and praying and asking God for contentment in that, and being able to be all right and, and fine with it. And yet finding yourself in a place where you're not and going, Lord, I keep asking for what I think you want me to have, and yet you never seem to give it to me. And you can't find that contentment. Or maybe it's been praying for God about your adult children and the, church, and the choices that their lives are, are, are heading toward, the direction that they're going. And you pray and you pray and you pray. And yet God doesn't seem to do the thing that you ask. And, and what we so often end up doing is we say, okay, because my prayers were not answered, because I've asked God for things and God has not done what I wanted Him to do, that means I need to only ask for the things He's going to give me. That means I need to only ask for the things that I know that He wants me to have. And the problem with that is that that is exactly the opposite of the kind of prayer life that Jesus tells us we're supposed to have. That that is exactly the opposite of what God says to us in His Word about how we relate to Him, especially when we're asking Him for things. 
And that's why we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 7, continuing on this issue of, of what God knows. And in chapter 7, starting in verse 7, it says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. When Jesus comes to us, he tells us that we are to ask and seek and knock. And he promises us that God is listening to what we're doing and will give us what we ask for, what we seek for, what we knock for. Now, I don't know about you, but I have asked for things from God that he has not given me. I asked God when I was 10 years old on my bed on the day that my dog died that he would bring my dog back to life. And God did not do that. <laughs> it's a 10-year-old prayer. I mean, it's not like I was 50 when I prayed it, or have been yet, but, you know, it's a 10-year-old prayer. God, I, I prayed for that, and, and, and God didn't give me that. And so the question that we run into when we get this scripture is we say, God tells us that asking and seeking and knocking means that we get what we ask for. We, we find what we're seeking. We, we get through that door we've been knocking on, and we find what's on the other side. And yet it doesn't always seem to work that way. And I think the reason he does that is that he wants to emphasize to us that we are supposed to be asking and seeking and knocking about every aspect of our life. That we are supposed to be coming to God and asking him for a lot of stuff in our day-to-day -day life. And I'm not just saying asking him for a lot of things, like, Lord, can I get that tchotchke, and this thing to sit over there, and that car, and this house. And... But that as we go through our life, as we go through our day, that when, when trouble comes up, we turn to him and go, God, would you please take care of us? That when a good thing happens, we say, thank you, or something good happens to someone else, and it reminds us of something that we desire, that we go ahead and go to God right then and go, Lord, can I have this? Lord, could you do this? Lord, would you please? And that that attitude really fits with the attitude that God wants us to have. You see, one of the things Jesus did throughout his time on earth is he talked about God as being not just his father, but our father. And he kept saying that God is your heavenly father. He is listening for you. He wants to hear what you have to say. He wants you to come to him and ask him for all of the things that you need. Because your trust is in him. Instead of your own ability to produce, your own ability to create, your own ability to make things happen. There's a great article by one of my favorite authors, Andrea Sue, and she talks about this idea. And this is what she says, better than I can say it. Coming to God like a child means having very little mind-mouth barrier. A child blurts out. He comes to his father with real concerns, not fake issues. Let us notice the places our mind wanders off when we pray and to follow it. To break down the fire firewall between presentable and unpresentable matters and to bring them to your secret gardens of fantasy and pain and fear. Coming to God like a child means asking God for a lot of things. If you stopped asking God for a lot of things, that's a bad sign, not a good one. It may be not so much that we are mature as that we are unbelieving. Jesus asked the blind beggars, what do you want me to do? If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Ask me for gold refined in fire. Ask me. When we encounter Jesus in Scripture, He's telling us to ask Him. He's telling us to ask Him. He's telling us that He's on our side, that He's there with us. That Paul talks about in the Romans when he says, if He loves us and God has given us salvation through Christ, how will He not much more give us all things? The thing about coming to God with everything we want and everything we might want and everything that's on our mind and everything that's on our heart 
is that we're going to ask for things that are a bad idea. That sometimes we're going to ask for things that we shouldn't have. We're going to ask for people to be in our life that don't want to be in our life. We're going to ask for stuff that would turn into an idol if we held on to it. We're going to ask for, for relationships that need to be one way and we really want them to be another way. We're going to ask for all kinds of things, many of which are going to be things that are going to be a bad idea. They're not going to be good for us. They're not going to be helpful. And that's why Jesus comes in with this next section where he tells them, he says, What man among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or ask for a fish, he will not give him a, a snake, will he? And what God is saying there is he's saying, look, you know how to do good stuff. You know how to good, give good gifts. You know that if your child comes to you and goes, I really would like to have a pet copperhead, you're not going to let them have a pet copperhead. Right? Okay. I'm just check it. You know? The world's a little weird sometimes. You know, that, that if your child comes to you and at 15 says, I'd really like to borrow the car, you're not going to give them the keys to the car. And, and what Jesus is saying there is, saying, look, we know how to give good gifts. We know the difference between a request that should be fulfilled on the part of our child and a request that should not be fulfilled. That we know the difference. And he says, but you who are evil know how to give good gifts. And, and there's a whole lot mixed up in there, but the reality is we all know how imperfect we are, how messed up we are, how often we have said no to our child, not just because it's not a good idea, not just because it would be best for them, but because we were tired and we sort of had enough. Or the times we said yes, when it wasn't that great of an idea, but we were tired. And you know what? It would keep them quiet. And, and Jesus is telling us, if you then, who are evil, know how to good, give good gifts, don't you think God knows better? Don't you think God understands more fully what is good and what isn't good? Don't you think that God, in those situations where you as a parent are going, do I let them have this? Do I not let them have this? They really, really want it. I'm not really sure I like it. Yeah, should I, shouldn't I? That God doesn't go do that because he knows what really is best. Then when we ask the question of, you know, should I, should I let my child go out on this date with this person? Should I let my child go to this social event on their own? Should I let this, that, or the other thing? And we as human parents, we agonize and we try to figure it out that God, who is fully good and knows all things, he knows the answer. And he wouldn't have that little value. And what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, look, you can ask God for anything, anything at all. And then it can be selfish. And it can be stupid. And it can be foolish. And it can be mean-spirited. And it can be self-serving. But that because God is good, and because God loves you, that he will take this lump of stuff you asked him for, and he will do the sorting through. He will do the, this is good, this is not good. This is right, this is not right. This is important, this is not important. He'll take care of that. And he will be the one to make sure to give you the good gift that you need instead of giving you those things that you should not have. God doesn't want the barrier in our prayers, the deciding in our prayers, the editing of our prayers to be us editing what we say to him. He wants to be the one that gets to pick and choose because he loves us. And when we ask him for those things that we should not have, when we ask him for those things that are selfish or wrong or, you know, out of spite towards somebody else or any of those things, that God knows that as they come out of our mouth in prayer, as we begin talking to him about them, we give him the opportunity to change our heart. We give him the opportunity to bring the issue out in the open in the front of our mind. We give him the opportunity to work on us in that area because we're asking him. And then we're able to trust him that because we don't have it, we shouldn't have it now. That because it's not there and his response is not yes, that he really does know what he's doing and we shouldn't have it. And it's hard to do that because we think we're really smart. 
And we think we figured it out. And so oftentimes our prayers are really all about this idea of I'm going to figure out what God is going to give me or what I should get. And then I can ask him for it if I do it the right way. And I fast these days and I ask in this particular language. Then God's going to have to grant it. But we of all people should know that God knows how to give good gifts. We of all people should know, we have already been given the greatest gift of all. That God loved us from the beginning of making us. And then we as human beings decided that we knew better than God. That we chose to rebel against Him. We chose to either do what we knew was wrong or not do what we knew He wanted us to do. And we ran away from God. And that, that created separation between us. And that separation, if it continues on until we die, is never reconciled, is an eternity apart from God in hell. By our choice, because we left. And so what God said is that that was not acceptable. And so he sends Jesus to come to earth and to live that perfect life we should have lived and die that death that we owed for our running away, for our breaking of that relationship. So that his death could restore us and that God gives us this gift by saying all we need to do to have that restoration with God, all we need to do to have that relationship with Him here and now and go to heaven when we die is to trust that Jesus is the one who makes us right with God instead of trying to do it ourselves. That Jesus is the one who fixes it and who pays for what I've done wrong. That that's all God asks us to do. That ultimate gift is our first down payment of understanding. That he not only knows what we really need, that we really needed reconciliation to him, but that he takes care of it in a way where he pays the price and we thank him for the gift. God goes on. And this is where it gets weird. Because I know some of you out there, as I was reading, assuming you were listening to me and not sleeping, I said, you know, if you then be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who's in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? And then we suddenly took this huge left turn. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law of the prophets. And what does that have to do with prayer? What does that have to do with God promising that, that He could take care of us? But the reality is, as you dig into it and you look at it, it is intimately connected to the sentence before it. He says, therefore, it says that this is directly related to it. And I think that what we're getting at here is that God is saying, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts, then we can't hide behind saying that we're sinful. We can't hide behind saying that we're imperfect. We can't hide behind saying, I'm not God and I'm not Jesus, when we treat someone else shabbily. When we're mean to someone else, when we're discourteous, when we brush them off, when we don't care about them, when we insult them, when we gossip them about them, or we talk about them behind their back. God lays out the golden rule directly connected with this because Jesus has put together a chain of logic where he says, look, you who are evil know how to give good gifts. God is not evil, therefore he knows how to give good gifts even better than you do. But by the way, we've already established, you know the difference between right and wrong. You know the difference between good and evil. And that God holds you responsible for the way you treat other people. And that the way to judge the difference between good and evil and how we treat other people is asking that very question. Am I treating them the way I would want them to treat me? Am I acting towards them the way they would want me to act. Wait a minute. I got lost in my syntax. <laughs> I'm acting towards them the way I would want them to act towards me. And so often, our answer is no, but you don't understand. No, but you don't understand how they talk to me. No, but God, you, you, you don't understand how frustrating they are. You, you don't know what's going on in my life between them. God, you don't have the history, which when you think about it, telling God you don't know is kind of a silly thing. God, you didn't see. God, you didn't hear. God, you don't understand. 
Because he understands all of that. He knows how mean your mom's been to you. Okay? He knows how rotten your sister's acted. He knows how that co-worker has run you down and stolen your ideas. He knows to the fullest and most complete degree exactly what you suffer. And I think that's the other reason he puts that golden rule right here. Is because he says that he knows how to give good gifts. And that the way we treat that person, even when they've been that way towards us, is not about us. Is not about getting them to recognize it. Is not about getting them to change their behavior. Is not about getting them to be different. But that God is promising that he is going to be there and make up what we need that we're not getting from him. That he will be the answer to our prayer with or without their cooperation. That we are responsible for how we act, not how they act. And that God will do what it takes, whether it's to get their attention or to shield us from the effects of what's going on or to simply give us the ability to let it go instead of grabbing hold and getting angry. There's one other piece that I wanted to talk to you about with that, and this is a, a, a guy in, in, of all things, the Discipleship Magazine that comes out of Billy Graham Ministry, but he says this. He says, For there is nothing that makes us love a man so much as praying for him. And when you can once do this sincerely for any man, you fitted your soul for the performance of everything that is kind and civil towards him. By considering yourself as an advocate with God for your neighbor and acquaintances, you would never find it hard to be at peace with them yourself. It would be easy to you to bear with and forgive those for whom you particularly implored the divine mercy and forgiveness. You see, we know better about how we ought to treat the people around us, but the power to do better and to fulfill this living out the golden rule comes from praying for the very people we're most upset about. As we do that, we allow God to work in our heart and to work in our attitude, to work in what's inside of us, to make us able to have a kind of disposition towards God, to make us able to extend forgiveness when forgiveness is not asked, to make us able to not just deal with it and put up with it, but to actually love that person in the midst of their inappropriate action towards us. The question that we've been answering all along is what can I ask God? The first, the best, the most important answer to that question is you can ask God for anything and for everything. And that what God wants more than anything else is for you to come to Him like that little three-year-old, that little four-year-old, that little five-year-old asking for ice cream. And to ask Him for everything you want. Ask Him for everything that's on your heart. Ask Him for those things that as you're, I'm trying to pray, and I'm praying, and Lord, bless Emily, and bless Joey, and bless Mama, and bless so on, and then your mind starts to wander off to something else. Then instead of going, oh no, my mind wandered, God's going to be mad at me. To follow your brain where it went. Say, God, please be over this situation. Maybe you were thinking about work and you say, okay, God, please give me the strength to do the work I've got to do. Maybe you're thinking about somebody else in your life that, that those prayers reminded you of. And then you go ahead and pray for that person. The idea is that God wants you to talk to him about everything. So talk to him about everything. And that is what I want you to do this week. Pray a lot. Ask for a lot. And let God Sort out what he should and shouldn't give. Let God sort out the attitude of your heart towards those that you'd rather not pray for. And yet they're on your mind and you know you should. And let God give you the strength to take whatever answer he chooses to give. What we're going to do now is we have a human decision. It's an opportunity to make a decision for Christ.